so that we can have more remittances and then of course our economy can become more robust as it were. Um, Api, you know, the president is taking the initiative to look at um, uh, the tax laws in Nigeria and the need to uh, bring reforms. He has considered the tax force to look at the, you know, to, to, uh, to champion tax re re uh, reforms in Nigeria. So the issue of taxes on, you know, high tax on remittances is also part of what this committee should look at in collaboration with the CBN. And that's the concern of NITCOM, which is why Abike Dabri is talking about it, you know, you know, uh, he just is in charge of uh, the welfare of Nigerians in diaspora. So the best way to encourage these people to pay more is when the taxes are not so high, when you encourage them to you know, pay, and then you justify the payment by also utilizing this money effectively. And so it's now expected of the CBN to ensure that the high tax on remittances should be looked into quickly so that these people be encouraged to pay them more and to also perform their obligation as Nigerian citizens. Mm, yes, uh, some of our, uh, those in diaspora have also deployed ways by which they send money. There was even a time people were sending money via post as if it's in mail. They were sending it in half currency and those to whom they are uh, sent will go over to the parallel market or what they call the black markets to have them change because of the high charges. And like it also has rightly said uh, that uh, it, it's, it's also about the charges that occur on people who make transactions in the banking system. You make deposits, for instance, before we used to think that it's only when you make a withdrawal that you are charged. But this time around, even when money is deposited into your account, you are charged for it. So the, the, the high cost of transactions in the banking system is really something that should be looked at holistically and not just uh, about encouraging diaspora remittance. It is very good that they want to encourage that, but I think uh, the CBN government should look deeper into that because really it's a dissenting. Sometimes it's just because you have no option with the cost, no. you need to keep money in the bank and you need to transact within the bank because when you look at the charges, so many, so many charges, it's, it's just really a dissentive. When you operate the savings accounts before, there are certain interests that are to it. But this time around, you operate the savings account, and it's, it's, it's even more expensive than running a current account. These are things that should be addressed within the banking system. All right, the next story is still about the CBN. Uh, CBN is playing its role now as a regulatory body. It says the Central Bank of Nigeria has reassured the public that every bank note uh, it remains legal tender and should not be refused by anyone. You know, uh, in a few weeks there's been this confusion about, you know, the issue about the new notes and the old notes. You remember a few months ago that uh, new notes were released and therefore uh, there was this deadline given which is December for the transition between the old and the new notes. So there was this confusion between Nigeria, which one should, should we give, be given priority? And so the CBN has to come into the equation to douse the tension that every note in Nigeria, whether old or new, is still legal tender. And, you know, because the apprehension came, because the deadline is getting nearer, the deadline is December, which was what the court ruled uh, was given initially. And so, but CBN had to come into turn in years that, okay, since it's legal tender, it's, it's, a, it's a national note, it remains legal tender. There's no confusion whether old or new until we have a new directive talking about what to be done and if uh, respect to the court rule if the deadline is going to be extended or not we don't know but as to speak now whether the old note or the old uh, new note it still remains legal tender and should be used in circulation uh, uh, nigerians we, we we need to always uh, have to listen and uh, hear things uh, people always get panicked over nothing and um, I don't know why we uh, had to hear him somehow. Mr. President, when he came in at his inaugural speech on May 29, irrespective of what, because the ruling of the bank was to keep a status quo. Because the governor took the bank and these people to court and said, look, you can't change notes like this. The president said, in line with best global practice, the new and the old note will circulate ad infinitum. He was very clear about it. And that's what is done everywhere. The queen is dead. You still see the queen head on the currency. They have not thrown them away. 
This thing has to strategically leave the circulation. As they come into the CBN, then of course, as we have capacity to print more notes, we can use it because this is also costing the nation hard earned taxpayer money to print new notes. So if the notes are still usable, so why do we need to throw them away? The, the real issue, which is what um, CBN really need to look into, is to look at the reason why people carry cash. And once we are able to look at that, then of course the confidence in people doing a lot of stuff become very easy. Nigerians are weary of carrying even debit card now because of this one chance people, whether it's in Lagos or in Abuja. They take your card, they force you to take the pin and wipe up your account. They take your telephone, they manipulate your details, they take away your money. Now, these are all the real reasons why people don't want to actually go and put money in the bank. And so for them, it's safer in their house. And then, of course, there's other religious reasons. People who don't want to save money in the commercial bank because they felt that saving money in the commercial bank, it could be invested in area where their religion does not allow or permit. So all of all these are the real reason why people have to hold on to cash. And because we're a cash-driven economy, we cannot but look at creative ways to ensure that we move cash away from the economy. But this also will require that those who are doing their things, they should do it there very well. We visited uh, Irembo, which is a digital platform that hosts the, uh, all payments into government in Rwanda. Uh, last week, and uh, one of the things that we asked was, how many times has this uh, uh, server been hacked? And they say, no attempt at all. And it shows you that they are protected. But you can imagine that how much hacking we do on a daily basis on our infrastructure because of the clever nature of some of our young people. So this is what we really need to work at and see how we can ensure that uh, cash less society really flourish because the greatest incentive or motivation for crime is cash. And if it's not there, people let people begin to do uh, paperless money. And then, of course, we can do transaction on e-wallet and the rest of it. A whole lot of things will be sanitized. All right. Let's go on a short break now. When we return, we'll continue with our news analysis. Stay with us. Can indigenous languages be promoted in a country like this? 
Huh. You know, statistics show that um, less than 10% of Nigeria, the population of Nigeria, has uh, you know have access to health insurance. You imagine if our population is about 200 million. And, uh, this is early exchange shaping policy, advancing development. Elza, earlier you were talking about, you know, uh, the issue between the bank and the new and the old notes. You know, the lesson for Nigeria here, I want us to focus on it. You know, the former CBN governor, you know, was perceived to be in a hurry, to, you know, to have decided to change the note. You know, he gave a time frame within two or three months, gave a deadline that, okay, Nigeria must shift from the old to the new note. And then one wonder, you know, what would be the reason for that kind of sudden change, you know, when it wasn't that uh, it was a priority to fix the economy. I remember the argument as, at that time was to tackle the issue of terrorism, the issue of, you know, kidnapping and things like that. But it was so amazing to have learned that an important stakeholder like the Ministry of Finance was not being carried along. And here we are now, it's looking like a policy somersault where you have new notes being issued and then another regime came into power and said, hey, let these two go, in, 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 uh, the new hold and the new, you know, should be in circulation together. What lessons should we learn when it comes to the issue of policy somersault? Well, I have had occasion also to talk to some people in CBN. Uh, I, I think the real issue was not uh, a somersault of policy of sort. Uh, it was the right thing to have been done at that time. Uh, given the fact that if you look at uh, the volume of money that was in circulation uh, compared to the one that CBN could cite, the difference was huge. And of course, being the principal agent that uh, monitored the circulation of money, it should be able to have oversight over where currencies are in the circulation. So this was the problem. And it was assumed that a lot of people uh, we're actually stockpiling this money, either for terrorist purpose or they were also stockpiling it for election purposes. And therefore, the liquidity of the bank become low, and then of course you cannot lend. So these were the real issues. So the policy was not a problem. Even the timing was not a problem. What was the problem was the fact that the implementation was what went wrong. Yeah. If CBA knew that all that their target were, were politicians, uh, so to speak, all that they would have just done was to discourage all uh, Axe Bank to hold on to high denomination notes. It was as simple as that. You have uh, $500, you don't see it in the streets. You have $5,000 notes, you don't see it in the streets. All you see in the street, the higher denomination of dollar you see in the street is a hundred dollar, then of course five dollar, one dollar, two dollar. Those are the things you see on the street. So that's all simply needed to do. All they needed to do was to ensure that you have enough of 50 naira notes, 20 naira notes, 100 naira notes on your ATM machine. So if you want people to take a you note, know, you go and take 5,000, you do your issue. But the problem was the fact that you were still circulating the high denomination notes, and of course they were not available. Some people are taking them, and they have stocked it. Now, you see, if somebody wants to carry 1 million 20 naira notes, you know how many Ghana must go will carry. So that would have been a disincentive, and then you would not have issues. But you find that these people who were the perpetrator of this crime had to lash on on the cries of the very poor who probably have 3,000 naira in their account and they want to go and take 1,000 to buy medication and they don't have. So this was where the problems are. And then, of course, on the other part, you see the POS people were feasting on them. You want to withdraw 1,000, they ask you to pay 100 naira, so which was really exorbitant. These were the real issues. And I think that's what CBN really didn't do well. But in terms of the policy, I think it was the right thing to do to ensure that the entire money that was in circulation, CBN can have oversight on it and see where these monies are, how the money are moving, whose hand these monies are. Then you will actually be able to track those who are funding illicit activities 
or criminal activities or endeavor within society. But this is where the challenge is. So if I have 10 billion naira in my house, and I call a group of people and I'm doing money, nobody can track me. But if I'm moving it from the bank, somebody knows that I have come to the bank to move this volume of money. Then, of course, even the security agencies can begin to look at you, how you are going to spend this money, where you are going to spend it. So if you have 3 trillion naira printed in circulation, and what CBN can see is just 1.6 trillion, then you wonder, where is the other money? Whose hand are they? So this were the real uh, motivation for that um, decision that was taken by the old CBN. But because of the hardship it brought, that's why we are looking at these measures and palliating. But in the longer run, I think Nigeria really needs to discourage the use of hard cash in the hand of people because it's a great uh, incentive for criminal enterprise. I agree that um, cash going around like that, particularly high currencies, is an incentive for uh, criminal activities, particularly when we're talking about uh, in a time where uh, kidnappings have uh, risen to a very great level. So payment for a ransom is it's done usually in cash. But the, with the implementation, even after the deadline, uh, which brought a lot of hardship to people, was uh, extended by the court, and then we saw from uh, after the election, there's been the use of both the old and new notes. I do not think that the CBN has done enough in actually correcting some of the wrongs or uh, the wrongful implementation of the, the Naira redesign. Because the notice was, that was given initially was very short. The time at which people had to change the old note and the new note was short. And it wasn't even available. You get to the bank, you want to exchange your old note for new note. It is not available. So there were a lot of more practices, sharp practices going on at that particular time. And it was not so, also not available, which created room for the PRS people and a lot of racketeering going on with the Naira. So we would have expected, or Nigeria has expected, that going forward after the time, they, because of the hardship that people suffered and they saw how terrible it was, they would have made it possible that people would have easy access to the new Naira notes. I, for one, expected that by, that by now, the new Naira notes would have gone round, naturally circulating, and you have less of the old Naira notes than the new Naira notes. But we still don't have that situation, and we're approaching December. Now, the issue of whether or not the deadline will be exchanged is what makes people apprehensive and make them scared, because it is still fresh in the minds of a lot of Nigerians, the pains that they went through during that period. So I do not actually blame Nigerians for being apprehensive and trying to ensure that the, for some of them now, they may even be doing a lot of stockpiling. If they have new Naira notes, they'll be keeping them ahead of that time. So the CBN needs to do a lot more besides reassuring people verbally by coming out to say, oh, don't worry, we should see more of the new Naira notes in circulation. We do not want to get to December and we're told a different story. People begin to go through that harrowing experience again. So more, I think that the lessons that we should have learned is how best to do things in line with global best practices. All around the world, it is not already done for the new notes to come into circulation and the phasing of the old notes. So we should copy that see, when we copy the, things. The issue with uh, global best practices, uh, we are very peculiar and unique people. And I think uh, Nigerians must understand that. We are very active. We are, uh, we are very enterprising, and uh, whether positive or negative. And you hardly see some of all these things happen elsewhere. Because where people make laws, and you have a culture where people are trained, properly trained, to play by the rule, you don't have some of all these things happen. And that's why those people can make a law and they know that once the law is written and everybody reads it and they know that uh, uh, it's not good to break a law. But for us as here as the people, the level of lawlessness in our environment is what we should actually be worried about. That some of the things that uh, we see here is not about CBN really making the, uh, making the whole blunder. Don't forget that uh, during the raid, uh, uh, EFCC had to raise some bank, uh, DSS went to some bank, and you see some bank managers who were actually doing this stripping, not CBN. 
This is Nigeria becoming wicked to Nigerians. This is the situation where you find everywhere. It's not just about CBN. We are opportunistic people. We're always looking for that opportunity, window to exploit. Just imagine today now, they say, oh, uh, NPPC is waiting to uh, make a decision on what to do with price of petrol. Go and see Q. Because we are just opportunistic. And it is not just about CBN alone. This is about almost all Nigerians. And this is a kind of attitude that is not good for public policies. Other clans, when people make law, they just expect that citizens will obey. In Nigeria, when you make law, you will go and employ human being to go and uh, enforce the law. Sometimes, as they say, uh, people are driving against uh, traffic and say uh, it's because of bad leadership. Because we have that excuse to give. And we are not responsible, we are not accountable. And I think that is what we really need to drive into our DNA as a people. To, number one, learn responsibility and then learn accountability so that we don't always blame people for our misfortune. Then we must be able to take responsibility for things we don't do well. The POS man who was doing that, nobody said he should do that. He just took advantage. And we like taking advantage. If you drive a bus to a bus stop today and you see about 20 people are waiting, you see opportunity, you increase the fare. They don't do it elsewhere, except in this our country alone. And this is the attitude that is not good to life. This is what is bringing untold hardship to us as a people. So CBN is even left at the will of the caprices of the people. Even in terms of managing the forest, now that's something that's happening. You know somebody somewhere, you take the money from the back door and you keep it away from the system, and then, of course, everybody suffers just for your own personal benefit. And I think that as a people, we need to deliberately think about value on how what we do impact on the life of other people and how it brings succor to them also. Now, I think the CBN can also do a lot more because they are the regulatory body. The CBN is the apex bank. How many CBN have that can man, man the two, 216 million people in Nigeria? No. Or they, they will have, a, they CBN, will have somebody CBN, in every CBN bank? CBN has the obligation to regulate the activities of the banks. There are places for sanctions where you find the bank to have uh, 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 flouted the rules. What have they done to those banks that were found to have been holding cash at that time you, and giving to some... If you, if, you, if, you, if you remember, even during the MFLA's uh, tenure, where, of course, the CBN made the rule and said every bank should maintain a deposit of 60%. And CBN started to fine banks for breaking the rule. All the blackmail were all there in the street. This is who we are as a people. We're only looking for somebody to blame. CBN cannot be in every bank to see what is happening there. CBN can only make a rule. It is the responsibility of the Nigerians who are bankers to keep the rules and not waiting for somebody to hold a stick to whip them or to find them. This is the real issue. Laws are made for the good of the citizens. We are not looking for somebody to be punished. If we take a punitive approach to our legal system, we will not get out. This is a problem that, look, we are building prison because we want to punish people. That is not the essence. The real essence of building prison is to ensure that people are corrected so that they don't go that deviant behavior. Those misdemeanors are, are accounted for. We are always emphasizing punishment, punishment, punishment. Now, why should a responsible person be waiting that until he's punished before he do what is right? So for me, is that we have to deliberately teach ourselves to do the right, even when nobody is watching us. But we have gotten to the point where people do not do what is expected of them. They do what is inspected. Only in Nigeria. Yeah. Get beyond that level. We, we don't need to be inspected. We have to do and take responsibility for our actions. That this is us. This is our nation. We have a responsibility to salvage it, and we are not waiting for any human being to come and whip us into action or to people. That is eye service, and that is why we are not making progress. All right.
This situation vice us what is obtainable. Is reality. Uh, uh, the reality on ground. And I hope no, the part culture on ground. <laughs> <laughs> which which is the essence of you know having this kind of conversation to enlighten people and to put attention to these things that has to be corrected. But I hope this time around that the CBN will do more in playing its regulative role, you know, because it has the CBN has to do that supervisory role, whether you like it or not. In a country like Nigeria, it is needed. All right, let's move to the energy sector where the Nigerian government is shifting its focus to alternative power sources such as small hydro drums, solar energy, wind power to improve electricity supply in Nigeria. You know, this has been the clamor over the years for us to diversify our electricity in Nigeria, not to over rely on, you know, hydro which has been the main thing when it comes to power sector in Nigeria. There's a need to open up that sector to have alternatives. And now the federal government is looking in that direction. And I hope it's not that the usual thing in Nigeria where you talk and then no action follows. I want to see in particular what will be done to explore the alternatives that you have when it comes to solar energy, not just for a particular area, but to commercialize it with the right uh, regulatory framework to make it available for an average Nigerian to be able to consume it because the challenge now is the over-reliance on the national grid, which we every day collapse every day and then where we're not doing the way, you know, the efficiency in that sector is missing, is bereft of efficiency when you look at our power sector. So this time around, I think it's necessary for the federal government to consider these alternatives. It does, do you think this is the miracle we've been wait, waiting for? <laughs> I, don't, I don't see it as a miracle. Uh, in 2009, I was in the UAE, and we were having a meeting and a conversation, and we were talking about uh, the solar energy. That same year, the United Arab Emirates signed a contract to build a solar energy. They didn't have need for power because their normal conventional source of energy was working, but they were only looking into the future. So the same day, unfortunately, the same company, Siemens, also signed a contract with Nigeria. And I told them in the UAE then that our own is on the pipeline. It will never come out. A year after, UAE delivered. We were doing 11,000 uh, uh, 11, kilowatts we were supposed to do solar power. UAE were doing times two. The value of UAE was lesser than our own value. They have since delivered their own, our own still on the pipeline. This is the point I'm making here. You see, we, we like to blame, we like blame so well as a country. A whole lot is not right with us as a people. This is the real issue. Nigerians are the enemies of Nigeria. Some people profit from these lacunas. And because it paid them so that we can continue to repair and maintain the things that they know that will not work, as long as they continue to put money in their pocket, that's the best policy. This is where we have found ourselves, where people like to cut corners. You've been reading in the news that some people have been making call and contact to, re uh, to reach the president because there are some certain sections of uh, actions that government needs to take. And somebody is making call every day. This is our problem. This is our nightmare. Solar is not anything big to do. Naseni, the Federal Government Agency for Science and um, Infrastructure Development, they have perfected technology for building even local solar technology. All we need is to deploy. If you go through uh, the city of Morocco, Casablanca, you see all the roads are powered by solar. Houses are powered by solar. What is the difficult? They put the element there, they put this thing there. Every house has so solar. When it comes to Nigeria, it becomes a an elephant, white elephant project. And this is because there's something in our DNA. And I, and I have said to people before that we need to go and look at our DNA. And check the blood inside it because it's, it's, it's so it's so frustrating that things that are not rocket science things that are so very simple to do we cannot achieve it and it's not that the resource is not there
just for the simple fact that somebody feels that he is the only person who is entitled and he must believe because the student must be in Japan, must be in America, while other people suffer at home. This is the challenge and this is what is affecting every sector. Whether it's power, whether it's electricity, whether it is uh, energy, whether it's gas, the same thing we need to deal with. We just call it mildly corruption. It's the wickedness of an average Nigerian. Well, uh, I don't know what lab we would need to go to where they can find the, <laughs> the corruption that, gene. <laughs> where they can find the corruption gene. I, I and if some form of extraction can be done yeah. to remove it. But I think that um, the system enables it. And the system is also controlled by people who are Nigerians. So it, it, it's a dilemma, actually, that uh, sometimes when you think about it and you're thinking about the way out of it, you run short of ideas because while you're thinking of how to improve the system, there are those who will fight in the system. And like you, you, like you said sometime, when the president said corruption seemed to be fighting back, there are so, it seemed like the, the, those in the armies of the corrupt are so much that the pushback against every attempt to fight it is so much, it becomes almost impossible to fight it. Talking now about the power sector, the government seems to be paying lip service into shifting away from the national grid and uh, the hydro part electricity that we have. Because if private sectors, individuals can at small levels do this and they are successful, imagine if government, all the money they've been pumping into the power sector, maintaining the, 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 the national grid and it's collapsing often, so epileptic, how far we would have gone. And it's just so painful because we have a lot of these resources naturally Talk about wind energy. It's, 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 it's naturally available at a very high level here. Something that can be cheaply done, but the will to do it because some persons would not benefit if power becomes easily accessible by Nigerians. For those who major in the sales of generators, what will happen to their business? I agree with you, but it's also good to balance this discussion. You know, we seem to be very critical about Nigeria, our DNA, what we believe, our system. But the truth is, in every society, you always have the good, the bad, and the ugly. Whether in UK, Germany, wherever, you always speak. You always have the bad ones, you always have the good ones. So you have Nigerians that are good, even in their DNA, still part of, you know, to, to do what is right. But I think, likely, what we need to do is, is a systemic problem, which has to be fixed. And then, Perhaps the leadership problem contributes to it. So I strongly believe, let's give our leadership a benefit of doubt this time around. That's why we're analyzing this kind of story. If they're saying they actually want to explore those alternatives, let's give them a benefit. Let's believe in our government. Let's even believe in ourselves. Yeah, if we that, say, is a, that is a question. Yeah. It's not about uh, systems. You see, when you talk about systems, the real issue here is people. It's not systems. Because it is people that run systems. When Nancy Mandela came out of prison in 1994, came to Nigeria to take our constitution, the one we say is not good, took it wholesale, put it in South Africa, and it was working magic. Well, it and the man made a comment yeah. that was so happy that Nigeria, we actually fought heavily to set South African free. But unfortunately, we have disappointed Africa and the rest of the black men in the whole world by the way we live. Now, the issue here is not just about leadership. It's not about leadership. Because as long as we are blaming issues on leadership, we fail to realize that leaders are taken from the midst of their people. How come? 774 local government chairmen behaving the same way. All the members of National Assembly behaving the same way, irrespective of parties. It doesn't matter who comes to power. Every president we have had, every governor that we have had, everybody is behaving the same way, and you are talking about leadership. All right. This is people, and that our DNA needs purging. If we must get it right someday. But the same people, All when right. they we, we, we need to go now. Did they do excellent? Because they are in the minority outside.
The point is, it, it takes Nigerians, you know, to fix Nigeria. That's the point I'm making. We won't, we, we won't expect people from uh, other countries to fix our country. So we need to believe in ourselves. We need to believe in our leadership, believe in our system. Everything rises and falls on leadership. So let's hope, what the press, let's hope to see what the present administration will do with the opportunity they have. Idauza, I must thank you for spending time Maybe with us. Maybe next time we vote for an Indian to lead us in <laughs> out of this revolution. Maybe that's the best thing I can do. We just need to do much more consciously. He's right. All right. We'll go on a short break now where we'll return our big discussion for today, looking at the big story for today, which is the fashion industry. We'll kick off with our guest. All you have to do is stay with us. It's Early Exchange. Idumota Market. Eko Idumota, once a residential neighborhood, is home to Idumota Market located on Lagos Island. It is one of the oldest and arguably one of the largest markets in West Africa. Idumota is a historic neighborhood adjacent to the Lagos port that facilitated the slave trade and later under the British indirect rule, it surrounded to exports that fueled the colonial enterprise. Idumote was also the location of an armed forces remembrance cenotaph called Soja Idumote, built as a monument to Nigerian soldiers who served with the West African Frontier Force. An Ayo Masquerade statue and a clock tower are also seen monuments at Idumote. Idumote Market is so popular that large sales are recorded as early as 7 a.m. The market is made up of hundreds of lock up shops occupying several multi-story buildings with some measuring about five or more floors. In 2010, the Lagos State Government demolished some illegal structures in order to improve vehicular and human movement in and around the markets. During weekdays, the neighborhood of Idumota is densely populated by shoppers, traders and bus passengers. From the Carter Bridge, ascending into Lagos Island, Passengers can see the neighborhood before disembarking at their final destination. Idumota market accommodates the substantial inflow of imported goods. The bulk of import from abroad are routed first through Idumota and then on to other markets through Nigeria and other West and Central African countries. The energy of private Idumota traders and wholesalers facilitate this activity where millions of US dollars worth of wholesale is exchanged daily. Idumota Market, Souk Enlightenment.
Good morning and welcome to Early Exchange with Blessing AJ, Femi Ayodele, Sam Oruoje, and Idahosa Osamanze. It's a critical element of uh, um, managing um, the employee employer relationship, particularly from. The problem in Nigeria is not corruption, and everybody seems to be very surprised. That corruption is not a problem. How can indigenous languages be promoted in a country like this? You know, statistics show that um, less than 10% of Nigeria, the population of Nigeria, has, uh, you know, have access to health insurance. You imagine if our population is about 200 million. And, uh... This is Early Exchange Shaping Policy, Advancing Development. Thanks for being with us. All right, let's begin to look at the fashion industry in Nigeria as we look at uh, the key sectors in that industry. First, let's talk about uh, expertise and patronage of uh, the Nigerian fashion industry. Of course, we do know that Nigeria, uh, Nigerians love colors, and so in every fashion outfit that uh, someone wears, you've seen a display of different colors. But to tell us more about that and um, how skilled the fashion designers in Nigeria are, uh, and they enjoy local, enough local and even foreign patronage from it, we have uh, a fashion entrepreneur and designer, is also a leather craftsman, Israel Judge. Good morning. Welcome to the studio. Good morning, madam. All right. So I don't even need to think too much when I look at you, it's all over you that you are a fashion designer. Thank you. Now for, apart from cultural wares, that we get to see a lot of craftsmanship, a lot of design, a lot of art, what are the other areas that Nigerian designers have shown great expertise? Uh, when you talk in terms of expertise, then you talk in terms of the end product of most of our fashion designers, the finishing touches of our uh, designers. You see it's right now, it's measuring up to the international standard and as it stands right now, Nigeria is one of the leading uh, brand in the fashion industry as most of our fashions outfit have been taken out of Nigeria, not strictly for Nigeria. And if you notice most times now, when you see even in TV shows, programs, a lot of foreign artists, a lot of uh, other counterparts of the world are actually diving into Nigeria fashion, ways and clothing. Okay, but even at that, uh, when we see some of these things, it's in the cultural way, maybe they, they want to identify with Nigeria, uh, some African Americans wanting to also identify with being Africans, but apart from the kind of fabric that we're known for, in the design, in other kinds of wares, maybe corporate wares, do we have Nigerians excelling greatly in that aspect and the demand for such uh, of, of their products? Is it high? Both yeah. uh, outside the shores of Nigeria and in Nigeria? Yes, I would say actually, I, then if you, in, in, in that direction, then you talk about Maya Tafu, he's doing well for himself. Uh, Wedge is doing well for himself. And most of them are actually based outside Nigeria and they have their own outline, uh, their own clothing line in Nigeria also too, and they are doing well for themselves. So it goes a long way. And if you even check the industry properly right now, basically Nigeria has telling a lot of celebrities in and outside Nigeria. So I would say we are doing well presently. Okay, let's look at the issue of expertise. I would like you to do a proper assessment of, you know, the level of the skills level when it comes to fashion industry. You have fashion designers in Nigeria. Do you think they can compete favorably with their counterparts abroad? Yes, yes, they will. What gives you that confidence? We're doing well. It's obvious in our in our works. It's obvious. It's out there, and we're telling the stories, and it's we're doing well. I say right now. Okay, let's look at the level of patronage now. We're talking about local fabrics now. You've seen, you know, foreigners putting on uh, Ankara and some of our local fabrics. What has been the level of patronage in recent times? You know, it seems. If you will agree that the local fabrics are, you know, putting Nigeria in the global map, what do you think? Mm, on that note, also, like what I'm wearing right now, these are Nashoke fabric, and these are locally made in Nigeria. Yeah, 
and present right now, a lot of our products are being shipped out of Nigeria, out of the show Nigeria. And even Nigerians are actually, yes, we are clamoring for other uh, countries' outfit. But meanwhile, other countries are looking towards Nigeria, towards Africa for their own clothing line. They're tired. They want something that they can wear, they're comfortable in. And Nigeria is the next stop for most of these other countries. All right, let's talk about um, other aspects of fashion because it's not just about the clothing. We have ex uh, accessories, we have shoes, we have belts. Now, for all of these things put together is what makes up the fashion. When you go to the shops and people want to buy because we understand that there is a, a global cultural influence. So Nigerians wanting to dress like Americans, Americans wanting to dress like Nigerians. So for those kinds of um, fashion that are not indigenous to Nigeria, uh, which we also have our designers go into, what's, the, what's it like in terms of uh, uh, consumer preference? Do Nigerians prefer to buy those kind of fashion wares produced by Nigerians or they rather go for the ones that are foreign made? And if, uh, what do you think informs the preference? Is it about quality or people just buy and not actually think where it's from as long as they're buying something? Uh, it's, 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 it's not that. The, the major challenge we're having right now is our branding. And uh, uh, our branding, one. Then secondly, if you look at the fashion industry, most of all this international market you're going for, they are already our own name. And that's why you see, they want, people want to identify with Gucci, they want to identify with Louis Vuitton, they want to identify with Chanel. So right now, a lot of other Nigerian fashion designers are doing the same thing. Uh, Maya Taf has illustrated, Yomi Kajwa is doing well for himself. Those are brands that are actually going out there and doing Nigeria good and putting our names in the world, on the world map itself. Okay, so what are some of the challenges that Nigerian designers are having to build names to? and also become household names globally? Uh, let me answer the question. The, the, the problem is this. We have, a, we have a lot of people out there, all fashion designers, but the truth be told, I did actually fashion designers. And all of that thing again, if you're saying you're a fashion designer, and you're not able to deliver on your deliverable, then what's the point? But, I'm missing this question right now. Okay, what I'm asking, because you talked about uh, some of the foreign designers being household names already, and people want to identify with them, the likes of Gucci and maybe Givenchy and all this. So we also have Nigerian designers who are on their own doing good and are also getting some recognition, but we don't have much of them. And the strength that they have is not yet as strong as what the other foreign names have. So I'm asking, what is the challenge in building a brand name that becomes sought after globally, that becomes even sought after locally, that they are now able to stand side by side the already established fashion brands that we know? What are the challenges? Mm, I won't say there's much of a challenge in the sense that most of this uh, Nigerian fashion, they are doing well. Then, secondly, I believe it's, it's, the, it's the gap between the international world. And we're, bri we're bridging those gaps, honestly, you know, honestly. If you check a BB Niger that I finished recently, most of the outfits are styled, they are all styled by Nigerians, not no uh, foreign outfits. Where. Then, if you check uh, Six Foot, they are all Nigeria owned this thing of uh, brand. Uh, Adidas are employing a lot of Nigerians working with them. Like, like you see, a lot of color infusion is going into most of their footwear being produced right now. With a little bit of batik print on, the, on most of their footwear and uh, all African inspired, Nigerian inspired outfit. And in a lot of movies, you see a lot of people trying to like wear Nigeria, look Nigeria and speak Nigeria. So we're doing well. Okay, but there's something you talked about. You said uh, some persons claim to be designers, but are they really designers? Can they deliver uh, when they can't even de keep the, uh, deliver on the deliverables? So that talks about skill. Yes. And one thing that has often been questioned about some uh, local product, it may look fine, but the finish, it, has, it may have a low quality finish. Why do we keep having that uh, happen in our fashion industry? 
you see a fashion piece, maybe a clothing item, looks so fine, but when you turn it in and out, you're looking at, oh, no, this has to be locally made. What is wrong with getting that fine finish that the foreign wares or the foreign products have? It's, it's not a question of, okay, if you're a fashion designer, which means you're handling most of the production of your outfit, but if you say you're a fashion designer, and at the end of the day, you're outsourcing most of your jobs out, the person you're outsourcing those jobs out, do they have the same interest, do they have the same drive you're having towards your own particular product? Because it's not their product, it's your product. And if you're, not, if you're paying little or nothing for them to get those jobs done, then they will give you the worth of what you're paying them for. All right. Let's look at the business side of the venture now. You are a fashion designer. I would like you from your own example, you know, your journey into fashion business or fashion designing business. Now, for someone who wants to take that as a business, I would like you to enlighten the person on what to do, you know, the necessary skills, things to put in place to approach it as a business. Taking reference to your own example of how you started. Uh, for me, it's also as a side also, but right now it's been the biz. <laughs> In the biz and and for anybody that is in that is trying to venture into fashion it's a very industrious business it's a very like a uh, very broad and wide uh, business a lot of uh, other angles to it but yeah it's wanted for you to like doing something you're trying to like generate money from what you're doing but most of the time there are a lot of artisans there they are very good extremely good even way more better than the fashion designers but they are not known they're just there but the problem is that the level of exposure, the level of skills is just, and you realize most of these people are, most of them are school sets or drop out. So when you're talking about the business side of it, it's none of their concern. So they are doing it for survivorship, not for the business part of it. So you take, it means the government coming you know, or individuals, okay, you're a made known, you're a made fashion designer, you're a made uh, known name. So a way of, a one way of you giving back to the society, take these individuals, Brush them up and let them see the business side of this, uh, the fashion industry. And in so doing, you're growing, they are growing, everybody's growing, and the country is doing well itself too. Your, your submission now pop up another question, which has to deal with the form of acquiring the skills. You have people doing it uh, in an informal way where the ideal on the global scale you should do it in a formal way where people go to schools you know put in for trainings what has been the challenge when it comes to acquiring the right skills in Nigeria? i hear this story that the best of artisans are from ghana they're from togo and so what is the missing link what's the problem I guess we, we tend to focus more on education rather than technical skills okay i study computer science but i never practice now i'm a fashion designer i pick up a trade <laughs> uh, full time in the aviation industry, but right now I'm doing fashion uh, side by line. So we tend to focus more on education, forgetting that education, yes, it's very important, it's very good, but it's a platform, makes you do things differently. So when you're taking education out of the old uh, thing, then you're missing the old point because it still boils down to education. But in that doing, you should realize that education is just a platform to broaden your knowledge of everything you're doing. If you're saying uh, school is calm, mathematics is not important, everything you're doing, it's smart. Everything you're doing, it's English. You're trying to get someone's measurement, it's sure that it still boils down to math. So you can't take all those basic things out of the equation. So it still boils down to you being educated and knowing that, yes, education is important, but at the same time, it's just a platform for you to do well, get the technical skill and develop on it. All right. Now, in getting the skill, what's the duration? What does it take? What length of time does it take for one to acquire the skill and become a designer? How do you judge one who is half-baked and one who is fully had the training? It's your drive most of the time. I learned for six days in a period of, uh, yes, Saturday, Sunday, Saturday, 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 in a period of... Six days? Yeah, six days. Before that time, were you doing some form of designing? No, I've been, I'll, I do freehand. I do freelance a lot of time. Like, I sketch for people. So, I like, what's the point of me just doing this thing for free? Why not turn it to something I can make uh, an ends meet out of it? So, I went for an end. I need to be careful the narrative you are putting out. No, it's, it's, no, it's surprising. It's funny, no, the person that taught me, uh, I, when I started, I didn't venture into May's outfit. 
the strictly females out there, the person that told me that was that's their own specification. It was an in house thing. So you go in the morning, you spend almost the whole day in. What did you achieve in six days? Because I, I find that to be very interesting and unbelievable. Oh. That in six days you could have the basic skills needed to be a fine. Oh, tell us what actually taking a proper measurement. Yeah. They know you how to pedal the uh, the sewing machine, your the manual machine, which is the basic. But I stop using the manual machine like <laughs> It's so quite stressful. All of that in six days. In six days, yes. So that was just the introductory part of it. Just to, you know, introduce yes. you to the okay. So that's not then what going it takes. Forward, you still need more go, time. Then to, going forward, yeah. you develop you know, you, you don't just become perfect at something by just you know, after six days and you're there. No. You do it consistently, repeatedly. It's something you've been doing over and over and over and over time you become very good at it. Were you able to put an outfit together in that six days? Yes. You have to. Okay. You have to. Or uh, the one, you learn how to thread the machine. And if you're unable to thread the machine, then you can go to the next phase. You should be able to like stitch a circle around, a straight line, a zigzag line, like monitoring, uh, perfecting you having a steady hand with your machine. And you know, under the manual machine is not that easy. You're trying to uh, manage your steady hands. You're trying to pedal the machine at the same time, so you have like you're trying to multitask, do different things at the same time, just to achieve the perfect uh, outcome. Okay. I, I would like you to talk to us about the trends in the fashion in fashion design. Now, I observe these days you see more of uh, local fabrics being turned into corporate attires. You know, it's becoming an appealing thing or the rave of the moment. Talk to us about some of these trends. Uh, they are not really trends. There are things that have been there. Fa fashion is a trend, 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 trend. It's been there. Maybe it's just been abandoned for some period, like a particular year. Then you go back, you revisit again. Then you improve on it. Like right now, you see, there's this rampage use of crossbody bags. It's been there all the time, but it's now bang in trade. And you hardly see anybody on the streets of Lagos right now without a crossbody bag. Can indigenous languages be promoted in a country like this? First. You know, statistics show that um, less than 10% of Nigeria, the population of Nigeria, has uh, you know have access to health insurance. You imagine if our population is about 200 million. And, uh... This is early exchange shaping policy, advancing development. All right, we must apologize for that interruption, you know, but like we always say, every exchange will always get bigger and better. We are here still talking about, you know, fashion business in Nigeria, looking at the level of expertise and the local and foreign patronage. And our guest is still here with us. He's very glad to know you are still here with us. Thank you, sir. All right, Hela, you were talking about the trends when it comes to fashion designing in Nigeria. You know, you're talking about cross, whatever, and tea. So I would like you to continue your thoughts in that regard. It's not the cross body bags. But, but my major problem is most of these things are shipped from the international market. Meanwhile, we have the raw materials to make all these things available, but the finishing, that is our major challenges. And most of these things are not readily available. And when you, tell you, when you try to ship more of all those things down here, there are a lot of restrictions. You can't ship this, you can't ship that. So 
it still boils down to the government making all these things readily available. Because they are here, but getting it ready, available to the market for people to make do and uh, make something good out of it. Why do you think finishing has been a problem? Is it the issue of skills gap or you know, not paying attention to details? Because I hear this a lot. What could be... It's not, it's not a skill. It's not a skill. It's not a skill. One of the major problems, Nigeria fashion industry is more competitive rather than collaborative. Hmm. And it's, it's until when we realize it's more or less like a collaborative uh, industry, then we're ready to, you're not ready to go forward. Okay, imagine me being a suit maker. Uh, I have my tools already available to me, but someone else will do the button hole. Other person will do another part of this thing. So you, until you realize, okay, this, uh, this is your part, do your part, let me do my part. It's not, we're not, fight. we all have our, we all have this, uh, the platform to thrive. So let's just by all means do that, instead of having an LD competition. Talking about competition, I've also heard uh, fashion designers talking about their works being copied. Now, how do you patent your work or how do you hold a right to your work? If, for instance, what you're wearing is your design and you design it first. By the time you wore it out, the next time you're seeing a design like this online and everywhere, how do you hold a claim to it or how do you hold a right to it and say, this is my work? some other persons cannot copy. Is, is that even something that should be in the fashion industry? Now for intellectual work, we talk about intellectual right, uh, property rights, but for the fashion industry, the creative space, uh, is it even possible to hold a right to a design? It's very possible. Okay, when you look at Tom Ilfiger, when you look at Versace, when you look at the rest of all these uh, brands I've named so far, even Yomi Kajra himself, they admire Tafu. They have their own signature finishing and their own, their own signature look. Yes, it's good to copy, but don't copy 100%. You can pick a product, then improve on it instead of copying it 100%. But what most people are doing, they're doing, and I won't blame them. Uh, it's still boiling down to the consumer himself. Okay, you're seeing a particular outfit or you're making casual. Because you can't afford a particular uh, outfit, you rather go for an imitation of it. There are guys on the street. They need to survive. They need to make a living. Even though the fabric might not be the same, of the same standard, of the same quality, but you make an imitation of that same look. And most of the time, you see, consumer, okay, I'm seeing this, thing. I want that same thing. This one is a fashion designer. Why not let him make something for you? And that's why I try to preach to most of my customers. You give me a fabric to work with. Let me, by all means, make something for you out of it. Don't tell me what to do. Just let me make something. But at the end of the day, you'll be cool with whatever it is I'm making for you. So how can, because you've also talked about collaborating, so how can that collaboration be done? Is it possible to turn down a customer if a customer is insisting, I want this exactly because the customer is king? Yes. Because you want to, how should it be done then? When a customer comes to you and say, I've seen this elsewhere, because what we grew up understanding fashion to be, you take a picture of someone, you go on the streets, you're passing on the street, you see someone wear an outfit that you like, you take a picture of it, you go over to the designer, ah, I saw this, I want you to make this for me. That's how the copy, copy thing came about. So now we have designers who have brand names. A designer launches a kind of outfit. Somebody says, make this for me. But you know, because this is your industry, you also want to support the trade of your colleague. You say, no, I won't do exactly this for you. I will do my version of it for you. But the customer says, this is exactly what I want. How do you handle that? But, but the truth remains, there is no way you can copy a masterpiece of the master itself and be the same thing. There will always be a little bit of alteration. You can't do it. Even in art, when you're painting, you can't paint a particular image the same way. If you paint something today, you tend to paint the same thing. You can't, since it's manually done, you can't repeat, you can't do the same thing. have this drama or scenario what I order versus what I got. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm happy that resonates with you. That's why it comes from not being able to copy the masterpiece exactly. <laughs> yes, it's my design. So if, if, you, if you're saying somebody stole your design, it's your design. It's not possible for somebody to steal your design if it is your design. But then there's, there'll be an imprint. Okay, there, there's this guy that I, that I know, 
And every time I see any outfit of any, on any individual, I know this is this person, John Pelumi. He has this hidden slit on every of his outfits. When you're, it's when you're walking, that's when you see that hidden slit. And anytime I see anybody, I say, oh, this is John, Pelumi, uh, John Pelumi's uh, outfit. And I respect him for that. So if somebody's trying to do the same thing, there's always an hidden secret trade is on his finishing, and you can't copy that, except he tells or shows it to you. All right, except that you've done a little advert for John Pelumi. Uh -huh. Or you decide to buy, charge you. Or, or you decide to buy a fabric of John Pelumi, then you rip it off completely. So I hope if the commercial <laughs> department charges you, you're <laughs> you right. But, but let's look at the lessons here. You know, the issue of what I held up versus what I got. What do you think fashion designers should do ideally to avoid this kind of drama? You hear these stories a lot. <laughs> oh, fashion, what, what I got, what I, what, I, what I got. The question is, why are you giving the outfit to, to start with? You're giving it to a regular tailor on the street and you're expecting to deliver the job of a fashion designer. I've taken his time to make a pattern, do the proper calculation in proportion of your shoulder, your waist, where, which is supposed to go to where. You can, you can. If you can't afford, just by all means, get, you might get something that is way better and you still look, okay, then you're trying to imitate the particular style. Since you can't actually patronize that particular uh, designer, just go for something else. Okay, let's talk about cost because you've also brought that up. If you can't afford that. So it, it, it seems like the, the, the price is what separates the tailor from the designer. And in patronage also, some persons feel that it's more expensive trying to make an outfit than buying something that is already made. How can that gap be bridged so that people can also make what they want to, instead of just going for what is already in the market, maybe massively produced and is not what exactly they would want? Is that, is that a question of we bridging? It's, it's, it's a different part of the market. We have art culture. We have the mass produce, and we have the we have the mass produce, which is the last phase, and we have the uh, ready to wear. So you're going for hot culture, which is quite expensive, specifically made to your own feet, or you're going for the ready to wear. You are you buying you're buying and you're altering the design to your to fit you, or you're going for the general mass produce. So it's different side of the market. So whatever it is, that's like one to three. So you're not choosing one, or you're choosing so you're choosing three. You, you, don't, you, you don't expect me. To charge you the price of one, uh, you want one, you're yeah, expecting to charge you for the price of uh, the number three, which is the mass production. It won't work. It's all going to the cost of getting the raw material of, for making this product. Then the time put into making that particular, just to, not like there's room for fitting. If I'm making an art culture for you, I'll call you. Okay, I've made your outfit too. Doesn't mean that production is done. You come, you fit. There's any need for me to make any adjustments, you adjust. And those are the things we're charging you for. So if you're, you're doing art culture, you're doing ready to wear, you're doing mass, product, uh, mass wear. All right. Um, according to statistics released by the Nigeria Bureau of Statistics, it's been estimated that the fashion industry has created over 7 million jobs. You know, uh, looking at the statistics for last year and the last one year. Now let's talk about, I w I'd like you to do more on that. What do you think the federal government can do to help the plights of the players or the entrepreneurs in that industry for Nigeria to be able to tap more resources inherent in fashion industry or fashion business in Nigeria? You realize most of the fashion house in Nigeria, they are all safe paid. Like, nobody's funding them. So a lot of people are thriving just to put themselves. And you see some household names that are well known. Some are just behind the scene. They're working, they're making their money. I don't understand it, but they are not all in everybody's face. It all boils down to the resources readily available to them. So most of the time, most a lot of people tend to work within their means. And if you're not like me, I have or like a two four seven job that still funds my uh, my my fashion line. So imagine that not in place. You can only go to the bank right now and say, I need a social resource, I need a social loan and they'll make it available to you. No, there are a lot of clauses, a lot of conditions attached to it. Can you meet all those conditions? Can you meet all those clauses? No. So most of the time, a lot of people just stay within what they can work with, and it's not helping the industry. And there are grants available, but who are having access to this? Yes, uh, Tony Lumelo is doing well. He's like in that direction, trying to like, but 
just few individuals doing that, having access to grants and all of those. How capital intensive is the business of fashion designing? Very, very. What are the things that require lots of capital? Okay, like a bought-in old machine. As small as the bought-in old machine, uh, you're bought-in on your clothes. If you want a perfect finish, you spend nothing less than three million just to get a particular bought-in old machine. As small as that old is, that is on your suit or on your shirt. Can everybody have access to it? No. Okay. We have the manual uh, embroidery done at Agbada, and we have the digitized. The least you get for a digitized embroidery machine right now for your Agbada is close to six million. Can an every person have access to it? No. So it still boils down to a lot of. Uh, but, but do you need to actually acquire those equipment? You can outsource that, you know, for a start, especially for a new player or someone who's coming into the business. Yeah, you can outsource. Quite understandable. It's, we were talking about fishing, uh, finishing earlier on. It's my business. It's not the same thing as it's our business. I'm trying to put in my all because if I'm outsourcing, yes, this person I'm outsourcing, as the same time I'm outsourcing to that individual, there are a lot of people who are uh, actually doing the same outsourcing to him also too. So it pays little or no attention to the work being given to him. At the end of the day, I'm it doesn't come out as clean as you would want, you it, want it to be. be. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, for someone who wants to be a designer, does it take you to have it naturally in you, to have maybe the natural inclination to fashion designing? You learned in six days. Some persons learn in a, year, in a year and six months. What makes the difference? Is it just about paying attention or there has to be a natural gifting for it to happen? Since it's a skill, it doesn't have to come naturally, which means it's a learning process. The skill, so you're learning it. What you're doing right now, it's not as if you're born with it. Something you acquire the skill in. I'm very sure this wasn't what you read in school. I did this. Okay, you did this in school. Okay, professionally. Sorry about that. <laughs> 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 so there are actually other people that are actually in this industry. This wasn't what they read in school, and they're in the, in the space of yours right now. They're doing quite well for themselves. So what makes the difference between the person who learns for six days and the person who learns for a year, six months, or even two years? What is the difference? It's your drive, your interest, your like, like, this is what, this is it. Like, it's a do or die uh, for me. Like, this is it for me. If I intend to leave my 247 job, this is my fallback plan. I'm not, I'm not doing it for survival. It's more like a business for me, like a name for me. So when I'm trying to do it, I'm putting like everything I'm having into it. everything is re being reinvested into this. So when I say I have any other thing, I want to, this is it for me. All right. You, you, you earlier talked about the need for collaboration. I want to see a situation where you have collaboration between our local designers and foreign designers. What do you think can be done to create this kind of opportunity? for our local designers to have exposure when it comes to the global scene, you know, it could be true exhibitions or things like that. What do you think can be done on a larger scale to promote our talents in the fashion industry? If you're talking about collaboration, you want me to collaborate with you, okay. And you're not in good times with me, your own local uh, designer here. I want to collaborate with the international body. Let's do our work in-house first. Let's collaborate with ourselves. A lot of big brands in Nigeria, yeah, they are doing well for themselves, locally and internationally. How many of ourselves have we been able to collaborate with? Now talk of going out there and trying to collaborate with other people. Let's do our own in-house work. Let's collaborate ourselves. Let's, I've done a lot of collaboration with other, not necessarily fashion designers, other footwear. I've done with Boot by Meta. In fact, I've been working with him for the past two, two years there about. So, and, and most of the time, people say collaboration. At the end of the day, you realize that it's not even collaboration. You're just trying to like take advantage of you. They say, well, let's collaborate. But you're, at the end of the day, when you're done, you realize it's not collaboration. They just need what you need to offer. When they've gotten what you need to offer, and they, take, they even take your name out of the old picture and say, as if collaboration never happened between the two of you. So that's the major, it's competition. It's more a competitive industry. For we in Nigeria, more rather than it being a collaborative industry, and that's a major problem we're still having. 
So what would make the competition a, a bit friendly, even though it's competition, but there's room for collaboration, there's room for people to come together, because there's power in coming together. People taking advantage of the other, but what, what would make it better for collaboration to happen? Are there things that are missing? What would fill that missing link for a, a, a healthy competition to happen? That's a very big question. Uh, don't trip my head around it. Does it have to be like people having legal documents to ensure that nobody uh, abuses the right of the other person or government has to come in, there has to be a sort of union association? How can healthy competition in the fashion industry be achieved? Uh, what's, what you just suggested, I guess that's, that's actually one of the reasons. A documentation, okay, I want to collaborate with you, there should be an official document. Okay, these are agreements, these are terms of agreement. Okay, if I'm collaborating with you, okay, you're a shoe producer, you're a shoemaker, I'm a fashion designer, I'm bringing my outfits and you're bringing your shoes. Okay, at the end of the day, are you taking my outfit? Am I taking your shoes? Since it's like a 50 50, at the end of the day, we end up winning. Not as if it's a one sided uh, thing. So that it's more healthy. Let's, let's look at, um, you know, the skills gap in the industry. You know, like you said, you have people who are professionals who are, and then you have those who are just doing it because they just want to earn a living. And as a result, you still have quacks in the industry. Now, what can be done to ensure that there's improvement when it comes to the skills gap in that industry? Are you expecting the government to create like a former kind of policy to make it up for you to be a fashion designer in Nigeria, you must have a basic kind of uh, education or have certification or requirement. What do you think can be done to improve the skills gap in that industry? I believe the, 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 the Lagos State government in particular are doing, they have a lot of uh, artisan uh, program in place just to bridge that particular gap, a lot of training for fashion designers, shoe makers, bead makers. So I believe that, that, that is not even a problem. I believe it just boils us, it's just the boys and to you as an individual wanting to do the right thing and do it because it's important. It's meant for you to be done. It's meant for it to be done. All right, it's, it's on both sides for those who want to learn the skill and for those who are training. Now in training, is there a standard maybe for a period of time that a training is supposed to deliver, a standard training that a particular uh, length of uh, uh, um, maybe internship or apprenticeship is supposed to deliver to a person. Imagine someone enrolls in a particular training center to acquire maybe fashion designing skill for a year and six months. The person comes out of that, being dedicated and all, there are certain things they ought to have been taught, but they were not taught because there seems to be a, a sort of knowledge hoarding. Uh, the head of practices or, or head of uh, uh, artisans complain of knowledge hoarding by their trainers when certain skills are supposed to be taught them but there seems to be a kind of hoarding. So they train for a particular period of time. What they should have learned they do not get to know. It takes them to enroll in another place to get to know those things. What, is this, what should be the standard? within every given uh, a time for training? You know, I said I learned for six days. Yes. Which boils down to me wanted to learn. Then secondly, if you're talking about holding, I know it, it, it's, like it, it's been in practice for a very long time, even before I was born. Then tailor, tailor, as it was called then, you learn from, it's an in-house thing you learn. You learn for like close to, at times, two years, three years before you do your freedom. But you realize most of the time, Depending on the kind of boss that was, that was training you then, maybe when you're supposed to do a particular thing, and that thing is very important, they will send you on an errand. <laughs> Go get this. And before you come, they're done with that particular face of that design. And you're back. How did you achieve this? You need to go find that yourself. And right now, that's why, that's why you see a lot of fashion now, a lot of uh, fashion training institutions are now out there. You have, advanced, you have your basic fashion, you have advanced, then you have advanced of advanced. So it not depends on you, okay, you have the basic, you want to improve on it, you can go for each has its own face. I know it's a way of them generating revenue for themselves also too. I, would, I don't blame them for that, but 
there are faces to all these things. You don't just come to the industry and feel you just grab everything at once. No, I'm still learning. Okay. I've been doing it for close to 10 years, but officially two years registered, but I'm still learning. I still go to video tutorials, YouTube. That's, that, the internet space is a very big space. So if you say you don't know a particular thing, it still boils down to you. We all have access to our mobile phone. What are you doing with your phone? What are you doing with your data? Are you busy going through Facebook just, just to... There are a lot of uh, online platforms that you can learn from, even for free. I've done one or two, three courses on Coursera. I've done with Upskill. And there are all platforms that are readily available to people who can easily learn from once you've gotten the basic knowledge of what you need to learn. All right. So you must continue to upskill yes, by your own then. self, self-development. Yes. All right. That's how we bring to a close the discussion today on the uh, expertise and patronage of uh, Nigerian fashion industry, both locally and uh, internationally. Thank you very much. Isra George, uh, who's a fashion entrepreneur, uh, designer, is also a leather craftsman. Uh, we hope that uh, maybe next time we will come, you have more of your leather works on display. What we could see today mainly was the uh, clothing design that you do. Thank you for being on Thank the you, show. Madam. We're going to a quick break. We're not done talking about the fashion industry in Adura. Stay tuned to L Exchange. men. Iconic sculptures and statues adorn major metropolitan cities of the world. In Lagos, Nigeria, the statue of three men designed to depict the state's cultural heritage and to usher in visitors and tourists into the ever-accommodating center of excellence is in no doubt an astounding work of art. Originally built under the administration of Colonel Raji Rasaki, designed by Bodu Shodende in 1991 and standing over 12 feet high, referred to as Agba Meta or Aro Meta, the three sculptured chiefs were placed along the Lagos Ibadan Toll Gate to welcome people coming into Lagos State. The statue called the Three Wise Men by many has become a major signature for the state. Three white cap chiefs clad in white wrappers melted across the shoulders and with clenched right fist as shown in the artwork. The images fascinate and create impressions in the minds of visitors coming into the state, captivating the attention of visitors who look with keen interest, pondering on the messages which the posture of the engraved images signifies. The three wise men has been relocated thrice from its original position at Ujudu Berger end of Lagos Ibado Expressway to Magodo area before its final relocation to its present site at Olu Moku Drive. The sculpture has suffered severe damages over the years and renovated. Bodun Shodende, through this sculpture, depicted the highest honor that can be afforded to anyone in the eco greeting tradition. The three wise men. Arometa, Souk Enlightenment. Can indigenous languages be promoted in a country like this? Um, you know, statistics show that um, less than 10% of Nigeria, the population of Nigeria, has uh, you know have access to health insurance. You imagine if our population is about 200 million. And, uh... This is early exchange shaping policy.
Advancing Development. Many thanks for staying with us on the early exchange. Now, this is a time where we look at the challenges in the fashion industry. Having talked about patronage in uh, the fashion industry, whether patronage locally or internationally, let's look at some of the key challenges that those in the fashion industries have been faced with. We'll be joined shortly by uh, Idu Ifeolua uh, Omolojala, who is... Uh, also a fashion entrepreneur and the CEO Echelon uh, Stars to discuss this. All right, let's bring you right in so that we get right into the discussion because I know that you are eager to know what those challenges are. Maybe you're an investor and you're thinking, can I actually put my money into that? Well, uh, let uh, Ifeolua Omolaja talk to us about it. Hi, Ifeolua. Hello, good morning. All right, so please unmute your mic so we can hear you clearly. If you if you can hear me, please unmute your mic. You're muted. All right, so let's uh, um, allow Ifeolu to handle um, that part so that uh, she can be unmuted and talk to us clearly. But before she uh, comes back to us, I'm just wondering, uh, having talked to Israel, when he mentioned the cost of some of the equipment, I mean, who would have thought that uh, is that expensive just to get a machine that uh, puts the buttonhole, it costs you like three million naira and for embroidery and you need all of these things to have a fine finish for any fashion outfit. So that makes it uh, somewhat a capital intensive uh, business to get into. So I'm thinking that finance must be one of the challenge You're for right. you know, because, uh, those in the uh, industry. You, earlier he, he made his submissions and one of the things, he t in fact the only thing he emphasized has to do with the issue of financing which uh, is quite general. It's not uh, exclusive to the fashion industry or if you want to be a fashion expert, you know, sourcing for finance. And that's why you see people confine themselves to what they have, the funds they have, maybe the one they could source from their family, friends, or their personal income. Like the case of Israel, you know, he has to divide the money from his regular, you know, uh, source of income. He has another side also, he has another job. You know, whereby his monthly income has to be invested or, uh, you know, diverted to the fashion business. So for those who don't have that opportunity, it might be a challenge. And then, like what he said, access to grants, it's also a challenge because you have to do the proper documentation. And then when you look at the requirements, how many fashion designers for a startup can we, will afford to be able to provide collateral and some of the things required, you know. Another challenge is the area of documentation. Certain documents are required maybe your registration with CAC and then some other entities to show proper documentation and accounting, you know, your books of accounting, which an average entrepreneur or a small player in Nigeria might not keep records because it's just one man business. It's the accountant, it's the head of operation, it's everything, you understand. So the greatest challenge, you know, when it comes to uh, fashion business is the financing, how to source for it. There are microfinance banks, there are uh, commercial banks that should help in this area. But because when you look at somehow the SME sector, which is where most of these players are, is usually informal. Some of them are not that regulated or organized, whereby it's easier for the commercial banks to deal with them, unlike the big players who have proper documentations, who have proper documents, who have done investment over the years, they have collateral. So if you ask them to provide anything in subsidy for the loan being collected, they can do that. But on the average, when you look at a small player, it becomes a big problem. And that's why they run to organizations. And I think that's why there's need for collaboration, like what Israel said. Some, virtually every you know, uh, artisan, you know, they have belong to one organization or the other. So there's a need for partnership, this organization to do what we call a provide pool of funds. It can be a form of cooperative to help those who are coming into that industry, young players, you know, to provide these funds for them at uh, uh, little or no 
uh, interest rates so that it's easier for them to be able to go into business. Another challenge is also... Okay, before you name all of the challenges, <laughs> and uh, I, I, I'm wondering what... Uh, what will be Kroger left for if I know what to do. Let's just say, <laughs> let's hear from her, because she's a player in that industry, so she can tell us um, very much what the experience or the challenges that they encounter. Hello, Ife Lua, good morning. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. I can hear you. Good morning. Okay, if I do, can you just talk back to me and okay. say hello so I know you can hear me? Okay, so having uh, some audio challenge with that, uh, you may need to tell me some more of yeah. those challenges. <laughs> so, another challenge has to be the competitiveness in that industry. Mm. You know, you need to be a known name for people to patronize you or to leave their materials with you, to entrust their materials mm. with you. I, I totally agree with that yeah. because you do not want the experience of what I ordered versus yeah, what I got. Exactly. So Which you, is usually you, the case. You're looking for referrers, actually. You have this, uh, particularly if the material is expensive or you want to use it for a, a big occasion. So you go around, ask for people, or you check online for names that have delivered so that you know my material is safe with you. What I'm getting is what I expect In to fact, get. people even see it as a form of prestige or honor when you say my material is being made by so, 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 yes, so, so, when so, you so, drop the name. You know, you drop the names, mm -hmm. makes you, it has to your branding, your, your personal image. So people look do expensive. that a lot. So for the small players, it becomes a challenge. Where will my time come? And there is sort of prayers and, you know, because it's a competitive market. So that's some also a challenge. Do, uh, relabeling, yeah. using labels of already known brands, affixing them onto their own um, their own products because they are not known enough to be respected. So they just want the respect, just want it to look like this is what someone uh, or that this is what this particular brand has made. But exactly. they're actually the ones who've made the name, and it takes a lot of time before they become big too, and they become known before they're able to now confidently put their label. But do you think it's also, it also has to do with perception? Because even when uh, you're seeing the quality of the work, it's good, why then do you need to uh, call a name or put the, the tag of someone who didn't make it on it? Does it have to do with the perception of the buyers? You know, I think it starts from this idea of we initial perception that foreign goods are always better than local products and now that we're trying to make a replica of the foreign goods or create our own product people still feel you need to drop names it has to be with your attitude our lifestyle way of life you know what what's the kind of cry, a car you drive okay. you know when you want to talk about your house the kind of clothes you wear it's a the kind of thing. people you associate with the status so we see that we are so personal and emotional about mm -hmm. these names that you want to drop them at any gallery to be seen is about perception. You know, people want to be seen in a particular way, especially the celeb. You know, we say you are a celeb, okay. You wouldn't be in position to say that my family was designed by one Tijani from Close one local to my area. House. Uh -huh, you understand? <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's like you haven't arrived yet. Exactly. <laughs> so it becomes a, a, a challenge. Another issue has to do with. <clears throat> attention to details okay. personally i have issues with that you know where some of our fashion designers they don't pay attention to them maybe in an attempt they have demands on them to meet up with the demands of customers or people who are demanding for their services because you must understand nigerians will like to look good of course so we demand we make demands you know virtually you have activities coming up oh, one day every weekend people want to put on actually particularly be, at seasons you know, like this exactly we're, people, into the we're fond of that so at this season to get the attention of a fashion designer is a challenge and right. as a result to meet up you know they have issues with attention to details all right we're informed that uh if is ready for us hello Ife. yes i'm here i'm here good morning I'm nice here. to hear you Good morning. Can you hear me now? Of course I can, and it's good to hear you. Good morning. <laughs> okay. All right, we've okay, been talking so morning. much about your industry, and you're a player in that industry. Can you talk to us about uh, how it's been for you? Let's start off with that, how it's been for you in the industry as a fashion designer. Yeah, yes, fashion for me is life, maybe because I have passion for it, and it's, it's 
not something that is easy, especially when you don't have funds. But thank God when you have, um, when you're good and customers patronizes you, it, it's something that is very easy and you make some money from there and to fund your business point where the customers begin to patronize you let's assume you're just starting now they see you open a shop uh, maybe you don't even have already made materials to display but they just know a fashion designer is here so what convinces them to begin to come over to you it's, it's a good job when you do a good job when when you are attentive to details when you're given a job to do and you deliver to them and they see that what they order is what they got. They don't they don't get something different from what they order. Do you understand? Because clients are very logical. So they will see that, okay, if I give this kind of person this job, did this person pay attention to details? Did this person deliver us well? Did this person is it when I wear this clothes to party and a lot of people will start um appreciating what you wear you know from there people people get joy from what they wear so i've already i've already um discovered that when you wear a good um outfit people love it and looking good is a good business when you look good you'll be attracted to so many people and people will get to appreciate you and from when people appreciate you 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 feel good you feel comfortable and you feel on top of the world. So that is what I see about that. All right, Ifeolua, our focus on this segment is to look at the challenges being faced by fashion entrepreneurs for the young ones to be able to learn some lessons. I would like you to tell us your story, you know, okay. some or highlight some of the challenges you faced when you started your own business and how were you able to overcome them as a form of reference and lesson for young entrepreneurs who want to come into the business? Okay, one of the, you talk about some of the challenges and you delve into it, you explain some parts. I'll just add to it. So one of the challenges for me is um, workforce um, shortage. It's, it's really a challenge for Nigerian designers when you don't have enough um, helping hands to support you in your delivery. Because when you get a lot of job to be done at a particular or specific time and you don't have people to help you out, you now need to do overtime and do night upon night just to make deliveries to people. So sh shortage of um, workforce is a challenge for me personally, and it's a challenge for upcoming designers and other designers. And to overcome them is just for us to know the kind of job you can do for a particular time. And when you finish it, then you will deliver it um, successfully. And another challenge for me is um, plagiarism, which is um, counterfeit products. Plagiarism is, we are faced to this challenge and it's something that when a designer uh, puts in so much effort, puts in so much money to bring out a particular good design and some other designers plagiarizes it and they sell up to the market at a lower rate, lower amount. And you feel like it actually reduced the person's image and profit, I tell you. Because top designers there, they will make a particular design and showcase it for their brand. And these people will admire it and they will be like, wow, I like this thing. I love this outfit. And they never check to even see the amount. People like Vicky James, we tag uh, our clothes for 3.5 million. And they will give it to another tailor or another fashion designer to make it for maybe like 500,000. So you can see that the difference is clear. And I don't think um, the end result or what Vicky James and this particular fashion designer we bring out will be the same thing. It's not possible. So it's a challenge. Plagiarism is a challenge. 
for us when you think that you want to make a design and another person or maybe you've already made a design and another person now plagiarizes it so it's it's something that reduces your profit and it's reduced creativity and innovation in the industry so that is another challenge so another challenge that i i think we also have is um, limited access to resources and funds in resources, I'm talking about equipment, which is um, sewing machine, which is um, good quality materials. Because I've been in this work for years now, and I see that um, a lot of people like good things, and they can some people can't pay for it, but they want quality material. So people like Vicky James, Tiana, they don't get their material in Nigeria here. They travel abroad to get the quality material to make their brand special, to make their brand unique, to make what they design, to make what they dish out differently. So it's a challenge for us to access resources in Nigeria here. So people that they don't have funds to travel out to get uh, materials and to even create something, it's really a challenge for us. And in terms of funding, if you don't have money, you won't be able to invest in your business and make, you won't be able to invest in your business and, and make a um, expansion in operation in their operation so we won't be able to make expansion when you don't have enough funds to do that we have a lot of things embedded in in a horse but lack of funds is is actually entering this thing for upcoming designers to showcase what they have to showcase what they they already have in mind to do so it's another challenge Are you there? All right. So you've, you've talked and about a lot of challenges I from I uh, can, access okay. to materials to plagiarism, uh, other uh, fashion designers copying the works of their colleagues and reducing the profit of those who are the inventors of those designs. Uh, you've also talked about uh, uh, a lot of things. So let me ask now, starting What's from what? plagiarism, uh, which seems to be uh, something that you talked about with so much emotions. What do you think can address that? Is it possible to even address it? Because we talked about something like that before in a previous yeah. discussion with uh, one of your colleagues. Is it possible to have a design and people do not copy it? Yes, in that aspect, it is not possible. What I'm talking about is, I'm talking about the price. I'm not talking about copying his or one designer copy um, that particular design. It is possible they copy it. I'm just trying to say that when they copy it and they sell it to the market in a cheaper rate, it reduces the image and the profits of that person because that particular style is known for that brand. Do you understand? To counter that with making such designs available for a certain rate. So instead of people going to some other designer with your design because they can't afford you, they still come to you and have something like that. Is it possible to have like different categories? For instance, you have uh, maybe a particular design for maybe three million, uh, and then you know not everyone can afford that, but you can make something like that, maybe with a different kind of fabric or the design a bit different for something less. So you retain clients who would want that same design instead of losing them to someone who will make them a bit cheaper. I'm, 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 aim, I'm, I'm aiming at the cost of some of these designs. Is it because it is out of reach of a lot of people? That's what encourages plagiarism, or that's what encourages people to copy other people's work, and they have customers who patronize them. Okay, so what's, what's the question? So can you come again? 
All right, let, 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 me, let me chip this. Let me, let me add this to it. Um, talking about the issue of plagiarism, you know, people copying styles, how do you think the law of copyright will come into play to assist in ensuring that your style, your creativity is protected? Because you're still talking about the creative industry and that is also applicable. Or is there a need to do what well, I call trademarking? You know, it would that be necessary? What's your view on that? Okay, I think um, what we can do concerning that is that um, there will be a um, different segment for, you know, clients pay differently. So you know that um, clients pay differently. So you know that um, this design that I'm um, doing for this amount and when so people that don't have that um, amount to pay for it, I think there will be a reduction in what you will use for that particular design. That is what I do. If client comes to me and they said, this is what I want, and this is the amount I'm paying for this thing, then I have to reduce some things from it and then still deliver a All right, let's look at, um, you earlier talked about the issue of financing, which we had a guest earlier who also talked about it. It's not always good to talk about the challenges, but let's, let's also talk about the solution to it. What do you think can be done to help the plight of uh, expert entrepreneurs or players in that industry to be able to access funds needed to fund their businesses? Okay, um, number one is that I think government should set up um, a, a board that will be able to release funds for upcoming um, designers so that they can project their creativity, so that they can dish out something good, and so that they will know that young designers has um, creativity. They, they, they have something they want to give, but lack of funds is injuring them from doing that. So I think government should provide funds for designers so that they can make use of that. And another thing, I think um, there should be a platform whereby designers will come together and share challenges, um, share their stories, share what they face every time and profile solution to the challenges so that everybody can can help each other to come up. All right, so when we look at the fashion industry, yes, there are challenges, but what are the prospects from what you see, having been there for a while, what are the prospects of the fashion industry going forward? Uh, the prospect is, I see fashion um, industry be a good, a big industry that it's really, really lucrative. Yes, there's real huge money in this fashion industry. If governments can actually support fashion industry because it pictures um, the cultural heritage of our country. So I think when governments uh, provide funds for us, we can showcase our cultural heritage and showcase who we have truly the Hebrew, the Hausa and the um Yoruba. So that is what I have for it. Funds is very important. Business side of it now you own an outfit and talk to us about the challenges being faced in running that business, the cost of doing business. What are your daily, you know, uh, constraints and some of the problems you associated with when, when it comes to running that business and how are you managing it for people who want to get into that business to have a better understanding of this management? Okay, the daily challenge is inflation. We know how our economy is now, like how the thing is now. So um, I can say that the daily challenges when you go to market today 
and you know that this is the amount of a particular thing and you've already given this client this price that this is i'm collecting fifty thousand for this outfit and you get to market and even the cost of making the clothes is up to like forty five thousand how on earth will you get a job of fifty thousand and you've already spent maybe forty thousand or forty five thousand on that outfit just to make the client look extraordinary in that um, occasion so he get into the market and you see that things have increased so for me i don't have i don't have choice than to so call the client and tell this client that this thing this thing i'm having this particular amount on this job those people that are ready to sleep those people that are ready to look good those people that are ready to to let to make people make them happy we actually had hope to that amount so so challenges we are facing now currently in this country is inflation on the price of things now so we are facing inflation so my advice for upcoming designers is just that they should make sure that they are good at what they do because in my own business if i see that things have increased and i've already given uh clients a specified amount if when i get to market and the thing increased i will definitely call the client and tell this client hard up and they will because they know i will dish out something good they know i'll make them look good and make a good design for them and i don't use an inferior thing they definitely know so they will hard up to it. so Upcoming designers should know that just be good at what you do. No matter the inflation, no matter the cost of living, you will survive and you will make your own clients. We used to have a textile industry in Nigeria that produces some of the textile materials, but that's not really happening uh, much in Nigeria. So if some of these materials that you go to the markets to buy, if they were produced here, would it in any way reduce the cost? Ah, yes, yes, because the prices of things increase due to dollar rate because those fabrics that are produced abroad sent to Nigeria here, they they are they are they, they increased due to the rates of dollar because they buy them in dollars. So when they produce the fabrics in Nigeria here, definitely we buy it with our currency, definitely. We, there's no need of buying fabrics with um, with dollar or or hero to you get. So when they produce it here in the country, it will reduce the cost of pricing. Definitely. Oh, great. Let's look at the issue of pricing. My question will be in uh, two folds. The first one will be to look at the issue of pricing. Okay. What are the factors, you know, that determine the price of a fabric or uh, what you're going to charge a client? And then I would love to know, why do fashion designers give deadlines and they, they don't adhere to it? <laughs> I had to actually laugh to this. Um, deadlines and uh, disappointment, uh, yes, <laughs> I have to laugh to that. Um, I won't say that I've never disappointed my clients. I will not say that. So I'll start from there because disappointment is something that is something we shouldn't be doing. But there are unforeseen circumstances that can prompt disappointment to disappoint a client. So let me cite an example. How I will make myself as an example. So. I, if I give a client a particular time that this is the time I'm delivering this clothes, so I disappoint and I may not disappoint. I make sure that anything I'm giving out must be a good job. I must do it perfectly. I give all my 100% in any job. So if I say that, I can't give my 100% at that particular time after I've already given this client the date. I'll make sure that I'll call the client and tell the client that, okay, I won't, I won't meet up with this time because of this reason. 
because I couldn't get this particular offer. So I need to get to market to be the, the seller might tell you, okay, my goods are coming tomorrow. My goods are coming next week. And then you want this particular color. You want this see, of material. So this this seller will tell me to wait till this particular time. And then I'll pick up my phone and call the clients that, okay, can you just extend the time to this point? Definitely, if I know that this this clothes is not an occasional clothes, it's just for the client to wear it and slay. I will make sure that I do a good job. But when it is an occasional clothes for me, when it is an occasional clothes, and I know that this is the only time the client can wear this clothes, I will definitely make sure it is being done. And I will just improvise. So that is why we have um, for us to improvise. So you can just improvise and then with um, being you disappointment, being you disappointing the clients. So that is what I have for it. So the cost of, um, of pricing, like what determines um, how you price clients, what determines it is the, the, the material, number one, because if I get a job from a client, I will ask the client, first question I will ask the client is what is the occasion because occasion will determine the the amount of price what I'll get because I know that if you're using this this particular clothes for a, a special occasion maybe wedding maybe a convocation maybe uh maybe your birthday shoots it requires details it requires um attention because these clients want to showcase your brand to the world want to showcase your brand to the world so it requires attention and then I'll, after asking that what is the occasion then i will have then i will think i will look up look into the style giving and then i will so requires this material and this material has grades. So you look the client, if the client is somebody that can afford um, something exclusive, something um, expensive, because some clients, they don't mind. They mind using uh, cheap material for them, just for them to wear something. And some clients will tell you, I want something extraordinary. I've been in this business for for some time, so I know how to 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 explain how some people react when they get what you did for them. So you you look into that client. That is this client somebody that has eye taste? I'll say it's eye taste. Some people have eye taste, and some people they don't mind anything. So you just check the client. Is it of high status or uh, the middle person. So when you see that this person is high status and she wants something expensive, something extraordinary, then it will, it will hard to the way I'll build the person. It will hard to the way I'll price the person. So that is the second thing that you will look into. And another thing to look into is to see what it will be needed for that particular style the materials you'll be using. Is it that you're adding an applique? Is it that you are adding something heck? Because we have elementary um, materials that you'll be needing for a clothes to be done, thread, um, oh, um, lining, then um, well, adding we all those things. But we have an... You, okay. uh, because I enjoy your conversation talking about um, how you you are able to price for a particular item or give the client a price for an item. What are the decisions or what are the things that inform that decision? And you talked about the part that concerns us all, uh, why sometimes you disappoint uh, clients. We understand it's not intentional. Yes. We can only ask on behalf of all these who okay. patronize fashion designers in Nigeria that you do more to ensure you do not disappoint any of us. Not you, specifically, <laughs> but you and your colleagues. Okay. 
<laughs> Thank you very much for being a part We're of the trying. show. <laughs> All right, let's Thank have a quick break. So and then we'll Thank begin so. to look at the contributions of the fashion industry to Nigeria's economy. Do not go anywhere. It's still an exchange. Fashion is more than just a wardrobe, it's a language which speaks volumes about who we are, where we come from and where we are headed. Fashion and style goes beyond just the clothes we wear. It is a powerful tool for self-expression and self-esteem, communicating more than words can. Far from a matter of personal choice, the fashion industry is a dynamic driver that continually sets trends and pushes the boundaries of individuals, technology and creativity. In the fashion world, various cultures come together influencing one another and leading to both appreciation and sometimes borrowing without giving credit. Respecting different cultures and promotes diversity in the fashion industry is crucial as it represents us as a people. The industry is at the forefront of setting trends and using technology, which is a key player in shaping what's in style, from the impact of social media and online shopping to the exciting experiences of augmented reality. Designers are also getting creative with 3D printing and digital tools to make cutting-edge designs, while artificial intelligence, on the other hand, is making headway predicting trends and giving personalized fashion advice. While the fashion world shines with glamour and creativeness, it faces significant challenges such as lack of sustainability due to the impact of fast fashion and this remains a thing of concern to some group of designers. The industry is determined to cut down on waste and use eco-friendly materials. At the same time, there's a growing emphasis on fair treatment for the workers who make these clothes. To create a more inclusive and meaningful future for fashion, we should embrace sustainable practices, support ethical production, and respect the diverse cultural influences that shape the industry. Alfreda Ambebasi, Souk News. Can indigenous languages be promoted in a country like this? You know, statistics show that um, less than 10% of Nigeria, the population of Nigeria, has uh, you know have access to health insurance. You imagine if our population is about 200 million. And, uh... This is early exchange shaping policy, advancing development. All right, it's time for us to look at the contributions of the fashion industry to Nigeria's GDP. As of 2021, the fashion industry contributed 0.24% to Nigeria's GDP. That you may think small, but when you look at the number of persons that are under the employ of the fashion industry, you'll appreciate uh, that contribution. It has gotten better, and uh, we're hoping it will get better. That's why uh, we're joined by Babajalai Kwega, who is the chairman and founder of EMC3 is a fashion designer and has been at this for quite some time. So he will talk to us about some of the thriving sectors in that industry because uh, the fashion industry comprises of different sectors. You have the textile, you have those who are also into footwear, different parts, accessories. So it's a combination of different sectors that's what makes up the fashion industry. Thank you for joining us on the show this morning. Thank you for having me. Very 
very much. Uh, it's good our morning. pleasure. Good morning. So you look very much a fashion designer. Yeah. I am no, in no doubt uh, that your works to speak that. Well, thank you very much, Bessie. I, I am in a way a fashion designer, but primarily I'm a content creator. I create content for brands and I articulate my clients' messages to their customers. Um, maybe by my accent you can see I am Nigerian, but I have an office in London and in Lagos. And I'm here this weekend, quite excitedly, to promote the GTCO Fashion Weekend, which is all about promoting enterprise and bringing designers as well as textile makers, jewelry makers, anyone that works within fashion to the fore and helping them to create some kind of um, ecosystem that brings everyone, uplifts everyone through job creation. Okay. So fashion is very exciting. All right, let's, let's begin from where you left off, job creation. I like to know the sectors that have contributed more to that. I would say within my remit, from boardroom to courtroom to runways, everywhere in between, you kind of have, um, everyone loves a sense of style. Nigerians are very stylish, a sense of fashion. So I think all the sectors are interlinked. And within the banking sector, um, what GTCO is doing is pushing... Okay, I'm, I'm talking about the fashion industry, the sectors within Nigerian fashion industry that seem to be contributing more to job creation, the thriving sectors okay. of the Nigerian fashion industry. You mean, From your experience as a fashion designer and also a content creator for the fashion industry. I would say specifically the sectors within the fashion are um, clothes making, of course, um, Adirez, you have um, as well as um, Agbadas, um, all kinds of styles of gillies as well. Um, shoes are very important. And you'll find beauty has a large part of um, job creation in the fashion industry. But also journalism, you know, because obviously people have to cover these um, designers, they have to cover the master class takers. So I would say the creation comes from mostly the textile side and the making of clothes. That's where it is. But we're trying to build that from a cottage industry to expand it so it becomes comes an industrial movement within that. Okay. While doing your introduction, you know, something remarkable that you talked about is the issue of content creation, which yeah. can also be applicable to the fashion industry. Yeah. So how do you apply this to creating content for the fashion industry and also uh, bringing what we'll call uh, a form of business out of that, that can also contribute to the GDP in Nigeria. Talk to us what you've been doing in that area and what can be done to also bring it in light with fashion industry for it to create to the economic growth of the nation. Thank you, that's a great question Femi. I think it's very important to segment the fashion industry, as I know it, into three categories. Obviously you have the runway side, um, where the designers show their pieces, so the clothes in themselves, how you make them, is the part of the fashion industry, so you need people and artisans to do that. And within that, you have models, um, and the models, male and female, you employ them for certain shows or for a certain, what we call distribution or presentations as well. Um, and that in itself is the runway. Then we go into the vendor side. So when you have vendors who are selling their wares, whether it's millineries, which are hat makers, or shoemakers, or let's say belt makers, you have accessories. Accessories is one of the biggest markets in fashion. And this is globally we're talking about. I can't remember the stats, but I know it makes up a large proportion of fashion. So you have vendors come in to create for themselves business. Um, you know, even if you come to the store, for instance, you buy their clothes, the business that it brings out of that with POSs in itself. So the, the whole value chain goes down from the people who make the clothes to the people who are the marketers of the clothes or the fashion accessories, as we said. And then you have another part, which is more the masterclass. So people talking about hair and beauty, people talking about the business of fashion. How do I create as an individual, a single designer, how do I create so much buzz through social media or through my clients a recommendation that takes my business to another level? So that means I have to think about the infrastructure of my business. Who do I need to employ? Do I employ a marketer against a, let's say, a seamstress or a, a, another designer or a tailor? So these are things 
that we're trying to articulate and bring together to help designers, um, you know, marketers within fashion, even jewelry makers of sorts, because that's a massive part of, the, of fashion is jewelry. And Nigeria has one of the highest um, productions of tarmalin and all semi-precious stones, sapphires. So it's not just the fashion industry that's here. We have to integrate it through the minerals and um, steel um, industry as well as the solid minerals industry. There's a lot of things that you need to link up. And that's what we're trying to do, join up the dots. Okay, so let, let, let's look at some of these uh, sectors that you've mentioned. You categorized the fashion industry into three. There is um, beauty, there is accessories, and you also talked about so accessories. You mentioned that Nigeria has a deposit of uh, precious stones and all, but what we do majorly is extraction and then we export. We do not do much of uh, secondary production here. It's just the primary production. How do we tap into that? Even for the runways that you mentioned, it's once in a while we get to see fashion shows, not much of runways. As a content creator and for those uh, other persons involved in this, how can we ensure that Nigeria takes a large size of this global market? Very good question. I think it's a very important lesson that we help Nigeria, the businesses in Nigeria, the individuals, Gen Z or Gen Z, as I say, because I grew up in Britain, um, they have a lot of creativity. And the content, as a content creator, we try to give them a, a fertile ground to be able to communicate because the most important thing for this fashion industry is that people are always communicating swapping ideas and exchanging business in the way of you know finding the right um, tailors to the right designers to the right models to the right marketers and it's, it's very interlinked so I think for Nigeria it's important that we find investments not just localized or regional investment but global investment and I'm not just talking of money I'm talking of knowledge swap as well. For instance, as you said, with the semi-precious stones, or we have so many raw materials, but as you said, the next stage of production or processing, we miss out on because we sell the raw materials quite cheaply, and then we even buy it back. You know, even these corals I'm wearing and such things, you, you realize that we need investment in some of these value chain lines. And if we can get those international investors to work with us, and this is something we're talking about with the Nigerian Investment Promotion Commission, the, the agency that promotes Nigeria. Find the right investors that don't just want to chop our money or chop our business. They want to invest in Nigerians and help Nigerians to grow so we too can not just learn to fish, but know where the rivers are for fishing. How, you know, we were talking in parables and such, but specifically help people to grow. And that's what we need for Nigeria, I think. All right. Still talking about content creation because I find that to be very interesting and I, and I want to believe someone is taking interest in that. Now for someone who wants to give that a try or invest in that, what should be the approach, you know, either as a small player or medium player or a, a large player? I think it's very important in content creating research. As we all know, growing up in school, our mom and dad said, you have to do your work, you have to study hard. And that's part of the research. When you finish school, you don't stop researching. It's very important as a content creator to go online. Online is free to a certain extent. Obviously, you pay for your package, but you can free run and research online other content creators, what's going on in the market? See where things are internationally. Nigeria is at the forefront of music, for instance, with the Afrobeats, you know, taking over. And that comes from the background of Felakuti. But people don't know in the world that who Felakuti is. So if you start doing your knowledge um, research on fashion, for instance, where did those materials come from? Where did those patterns come from? See where they originate from. A lot of them do originate from Africa. As Pablo Picasso, the great artist, once said, you know, good artists borrow, but great artists steal. And they've taken a lot from Africa. So you have to see where the content comes from so you know how to emerge it in a new style. And I think research is very important. Read magazines, read fashion um, blogs, just see what's going on out there so you can find out where your edge and niche are. Small, small. Okay, talking about emerging, what, what are the emerging trends in the fashion industry? Where's the market tilting to right now? 
I think from what I've seen, and I am no master class taker of this, but um, from what I see, colors. There's an effervescence of colors coming in. The world is in a surreal time. Um, there's a lot of harshness going on internationally as well as nationally. We know austerity measures and inflation are both in, in, at the same time happening, which is a strange thing. But people are seeming to come out with vibrant colors. There's a celebration of Africans' colors. When you go to a wedding on Saturday, as one does sometimes, you see the effervescence of colors, the kaleidoscope of colors. And that is seeping into the fashion world now. We just had London Fashion Week in London. We got the GT Co Fashion Weekend. You'll see it's a lot about colors. It's about promoting colors and positivity. Because even in, in the, we have a great uh, the model coming, Jordan Dunn, and she's gonna be speaking about mental health. That's very important for us in fashion. So colors helps that key code to uplift you. And hairstyles, you know, hairstyles are, are coming up and the hair trends are coming up. So fashion is the cloth, of course, colors, but also ladies' hairstyles and men as well. So what you just uh, talked about describes the very essence of African fashion. What does that mean for African fashion business right now? I think it's something to be celebrated. We need to find our own square root, as they say, and use our heritage and our culture to exacerbate who we are. Because we've come in from England just two days ago. I know a lot of British and Europeans, they love the African culture. They don't want us to copy them. They actually want to copy us, to be quite honest. So if you have a natural style or natural trend or theme that you're working with that comes from your own state, your family, you know, use that. So I think the trends are very important to be almost pure from oneself, almost spiritual in its essence. And I think that will come through. It takes time, though. It takes time. All right. Earlier you talked about the jewelry business of a sector. I would like you to talk to us about the peculiar opportunities here in Nigeria and then the economic value this can have to our economy, especially when this kind of uh, materials have been pushed abroad. It's, uh, I think Nigeria has always had an age-old um, fabric of women in business. I start with women because obviously my mother was a woman, God rest her soul. Um, and women are always in our businesses not as valued as they should be, I believe. Because you have Fumilayo, obviously Kuti, Fela's mom, who was one of the great protesters and activists that made our country in the 19, early 50s and then, you know, taken over by whoever was taken over. But what I'm saying is that women are integral to the progression of our GDP, especially in fashion and specifically in jewelry. You find that the, there are a lot of um, businesses that are run by women. The, the raw materials are brought in and the artisans that put the pieces together in jewelry, uh, women. So I think that we need to have more education, more training, uh, more courses or workshops to help people understand that we don't just have to give raw materials. We can actually design here styles and use that finished product to sell on. And it's connecting with your NIPC agent. It's connecting with the bank itself, GTCO, to understand where can I find the next level of investment. Or it's not just money, but knowledge swap as well. You, you, you've been talking a lot about um, the fashion week that you've attended in London and even in Nigeria because you're a content creator. But what is the business side of content creation or fashion content creating? We used to see these things in magazines and then uh, recently when uh, e-commerce started, you find that uh, some fashion designers are by themselves selling their works and showcasing their works by themselves online. So how does a content creator make business out of it? Uh, I think uh, in this day and age, we're very lucky. We have um, internet. It's a very powerful force for good and for bad. But content creators are able to use that platform, whether it's Instagram or X or any form of um, social media platform like TikTok, that to, to show their wares. So for people 
who see these wares, they, they have an attraction that says, oh, I like that cloth, or I like that jewelry, I like that ghillie, or whatever it is, I want to buy it. So as a content creator, I have to make it the environment attractive enough for my clients, who may be the designer or the bank, to entice people. You don't need millions and millions of people liking your, your actual page. You just need people buying your goods. So it's how you package it and what you're selling is very important and the packaging is how you have your processes set is it easy to maneuver uh, is it easy to contact you is it easy to pay for something your delivery is very important as well who delivers for you so i think it's all these parts play a part a part in making the whole of the business side your pricing is also important all right let me give you the opportunity to talk about the GT core. You, you, you keep talking about it. Maybe we could collaborate or do businesses <laughs> together. All right. So uh, what advantage is inherent in this kind of platform? What opportunity will you bring on board to help the industry and the contribution to the GDP? It's a very good question. Again, I like this because for us, it's about promoting enterprise. And the key is to link up the dots in the fashion industry to banking to manufacturing. I've talked about you know the solid minerals and our resources and diversification of our resources to make fashion grow. So within the GT Co Fashion Weekend, which is this weekend, 11th to 12th at Water Corporation Road Oniru, and um, we have three parts. The main part for us is the stalls. We have 120 stalls of fashion labels that are being set up. So everyone is welcome. It's free to enter. There's no problem. You just, when you come, you can get online as well, Wi-Fi, to come to the venue. The venue is so big. It's the biggest arena of such of its kind in Africa. It's Africa finest being um, shown and um, actually promoted them individually. Okay, what we're actually asking is this. For shows like that, uh, even the London Fashion Week that you attended, what's, what's the impact on the fashion industry? How does it bring business to the, 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 the fashion designers and to those who are in, in that sector? 40,000 people in two days is business. That's what I call business. I didn't need 40,000 likes on my page. What we do is people come to the arena and they buy. So when you have footfall of 40,000 people in two days, even sometimes 60,000, we're not sure tomorrow and Sunday we'll know after that, they come and buy. And for us, it's very important they buy from all these designers and all the people working in fashion. And that's the main thing. And they come and learn in masterclass, knowledge swap, and they come and see the fashions on the runway. So it's buying. Buying and selling is key. All right. So in, in, from what you've also talked about, you've shown a collaboration from the finance sector and manufacturers and all of that come into the fashion industry. But before this time, the fashion industry had not gained much attention from uh, the financial sector. There's not been much collaboration. So what, what has been that thing missing that is beginning to be revealed now to the, the financial sector about the, 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 fi the, the fashion industry? By this, I'm asking, what are the opportunities there that have not yet been explored? I think everyone in, I mean, we have over 200 million people in Nigeria. And I would say a large amount of them are the youths, as we know, statistically, under 30. And they're very interested in two things. Obviously, many things, but specifically clothes and food. So the banking industry realized that the clothes is very important, or how you dress, your fashion. And what they're trying to do is help people within fashion with small loans, um, facilitation of bank accounts. Um, SMEs make up the biggest part of any country's gross domestic product. So give them the fertile ground to be able to expand their business and even to market their business. And that's what it's about. It's a marketplace. All right. As we wrap up, I would like to know what kind of intervention or a kind of policy are you expecting from the federal government to be able to maximize the potential inherent in fashion industry in Nigeria? I would say very important is communication, 
identifying the fashion industry as is being seen with the music industry as a huge potential export of Nigeria and import because we have a lot of people who are coming flying in for this event but I think the government policy should be to allow opportunities with policies maybe grants as well for fashion designers to expand the value chain that's the most important. All right, finally, I would ask you, there are different kinds of journalism. You have sports journalism, you have fashion journalism, which you also talked about. Uh, it's visibly seen at the runways. But in this part of the world, it's not very much appreciated. We do not have much of that ongoing. In other climes, lots of designers will strive to gain the attention of fashion journalists just to be written, just to have their piece written and even being critiqued by them. What does this do or what will it do for Nigerian designers? when we have, if we have that a lot? I think it's important to also you know, accentuate that the social media, they feel they can do it themselves. They have influences to do that. So it makes journalism a bit more challenging. But I think it is important because the journalism, like you'll find Soup TV channel, is online and it streams to the right um, people and the right demographics. So designers need to work with journalists to expand their remit and their audience because you can't all think you're an island yourself you need to work with others and i think collaboration with journalists and respect of journalism is very important in the fashion industry and i know that i have to say thank you very much for being on the show today thank it's been you. great having you thank you very much all right i've been talking with baba jella ekwega the chairman and founder of emc3 who's a content creator is also fashion a uh, designer is a fashion enthusiast as well as you clearly see on him. That's been the show today. Thank you for watching. It's Friday and uh, we thank God it is Friday, of course. That means uh, you have the privilege now to go have uh, your weekend, enjoy, make sure you have enough rest, but also strategize ahead uh, the, the coming week so that you have a fruitful and very rewarding week. I am blessing AHA. All right, while you're making plans for your weekend, you can also make plans for a catch up of this program on our YouTube platform or you go on our social media platform at Soup News. I am Femi Ayodele. Have a great weekend.